coverage and have to defend themselves at the table in the courtroom and pay those, one, the case, because in that particular situation, um, the victim was really a department chair, was a vulnerable victim, I meant vulnerable department chair, should have known better, we had a consensual relationship policy, do not date your students or anyone else who you've got authority over. Um, otherwise, you're on your own from a legal standpoint, and I just don't want that to happen to you. So be aware we do have that policy. It doesn't mean you can't fall in love with somebody in the biology department if you're in chemistry, okay? Or that you found your wife or husband to be in your class, but nothing is gonna go on, ladies and gentlemen, nothing is gonna go on while you have authority over that student. Okay, later after it's all said and done, you can go get the number, but not while you're the one. <laughs> you know, we are not the love police. We love you to love. Um, all right, so I think I've made my point on that. The other thing I wanted to point out about our harassment is hostile environment um, has to be balanced against academic freedom. Okay, so there's this case out of, um, I forgot where it's out of, Benel Maycomb Community College. So this professor taught English literature and had the right to teach some sexually explicit literature. It was germane to the course conduct com content. The problem was is he started ostracizing the students because he'd bring up his own personal sexual experiences and want the students to describe theirs. Totally got off the point with the literature. Um, when the students complained about it, then he ostracized them. So the, the university disciplined him, he sued, and he lost, thank goodness. And the bottom line is the last bullet. Academic freedom, which is what he argued. I've got free speech rights. I'm the teacher in the class. I can teach whatever I want. Not whatever you want. <laughs> there are limits, and you can't create a hostile learning environment. So the academic freedom cannot compromise a student's right to learn in a hostile free environment. The professor's speech must be germane to the course content as measured by professional standards. That's the case law. That case law is sort of codified in our harassment policy, and that's the language that's in the actual policy. So let me move on. Um, Cleary Act, I want to just briefly mention that. For those of you, anyone want to, maybe too early, if you are going to be an advisor to a student organization, raise your hand. Anyone, an advisor to a student org, or you might, if you become one, I see a couple hands. Um, if you are an advisor to a student org, then you have a responsibility if you learn about crimes, if somebody reports a crime to you, you have a responsibility to contact our Cleary coordinator and tell them about the crime you heard about. Don't worry about what crime, I'd rather you just report it, okay? You can go to the website to see what the crimes are. Um, the picture of this uh, young lady on the slide is, is Jean Ann Cleary. This is um, a young lady who was murdered and raped in her dorm room at Lehigh University in the early, late 80s. And as a result of her parents not knowing what kind of environment um, what crimes occurred in the area of the school, we now, since then, all higher ed institutions have to file annual security reports and report accurately and um, all the crimes that are reported to us. It, it doesn't matter when the crime occurred. So this is a very important statute. If we don't get this right, $54,000 per violation. It's important if you're going to be doing anything with student activities and you're the adult in charge, then you have to make these reports and that gives you the information on that. All right, accommodating students, uh, student and employees' religious beliefs is this next section. Just a couple slides on that. We have posted some guidelines on the Provost website. I'll give you the website to it. And basically, if you just read this slide, you'll get it. Faculty are required to make reasonable efforts to accommodate sincerely held religious practices and observances of students unless the accommodation would create an undue hardship on the university. Um, our, the guidelines say, look, we've got a schedule. If, when you're scheduling your exams, you may want to take a look at the religious holidays on the interfaith calendar that's online and just be aware of that. Um, you need to include on your syllabus, and if you, you, if you use Lorne's, is it um, Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, if you use the online syllabus tool that you'll learn about if you haven't, and 
and you have to use that tool. It's already pre-populated. It's this statement's already on there. You don't have to worry about it. But that students should notify faculty in writing or an email in the first two weeks of the semester of their intent to be absent from class for religious observance. And then faculty, you need to provide students who gave you that notice and are absent a reasonable opportunity to complete the academic responsibilities in the original or alternative form without any penalty, unless doing so would interfere unreasonably with the academic integrity of the course. If you two can't work it out, student and teacher can't work it out, then the student can file a grievance. If you are an employee, because you're both, and you need a, an, a, uh, an accommodation in your employment capacity, then we have kind of a one-stop shop, um, and I give you the website that if you need accommodation for disability, religion, or pregnancy, you go to that website and then they'll break it down. Okay, if it's pregnancy, click here. If it's religious observance, click here. If it's disability, click here. And basically, same rules apply. We provide reasonable accommodations for employees, sincerely held religious beliefs, unless it would impose an undue hardship. The way you do it as an employee is you fill out the form that's online. Okay, so I just want you to know that's available. Um, and all through this, employees have to engage in interactive dialogue with our HR partner for that department. Because um, sometimes it may be shift work, that's usually not your situation. It's going to be whether you're going to miss a class or not. But realize that those are there. All right, we're going to start flying. Students with disabilities. Your little legal lesson for the day. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and Section 504 of the Rehab Act in 1972 requires that students with disabilities who are otherwise qualified must receive reasonable accommodations and are protected from discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. Okay, that's what those laws, and every time the words are in quotes, there's like a million cases determining what those words mean. Um, for, your, for your point here, you don't determine whether a disability exists. I don't get to do that. There's an office on campus, the Office of Disability Services. They're going to gather documentation from the student and they're going to make a decision whether or not there's a disability that entitles them to a reasonable accommodation. Um, they will then prepare, ODS will prepare an accommodation notice and then give it to the student. The student is then going to bring it to you. Your job is not to argue with the student, discuss it in front of everybody else. That was one of the GTAs that caused legal liability. That's exactly what happened. Didn't know about ADA, got this notice in front of all the class, started arguing that no special accommodations were going to be given to her students, and um, violated FERPA. Violated, it was awful, awful, awful. We resolved it immediately because we were wrong, and then we got that person um, some training so don't don't discuss this in front of everyone else if we need to make a, a, a schedule an appointment with the student to discuss it do that um, but it's not your job to ask about the disability and i beg you don't do that because if you don't know what the disability is it's hard for you to discriminate against somebody based on that disability all you know is that this office has told you to provide a reasonable accommodation and all you all you have to do is do what they've asked you to do um, a student also has to be otherwise qualified, so they have to meet the essential functions of being a student. So in other words, we're not going to lower our academic standards at the university. Um, that is not a reasonable accommodation, okay? They have to meet the essential functions of our um, admission criteria. They have to comply with essential attendance policies. They have to comply with our honor code. There's a case out there where somebody plagiarized and said it was because of my disability. The court said no. You're not otherwise qualified as a student. We don't have to accommodate you violating the honor code. And then you cannot threaten the health or safety of others, and you're going to get some speakers on that later today. So once you have a disability and you're otherwise qualified, then the law says we've got to provide reasonable accommodations. So this slide sort of tells you all the types of reasonable accommodations. And in your context, you might be looking at time and a half on test, distraction-free testing environments. You might have an interpreter. You may be asked to give your PowerPoint slides, whatever. This slide sort of covers that. Um, if your office is inaccessible and the student needs to meet with you, you need to figure out another place for you to meet. And I would wisely encourage you not to do it at your home or at midnight or at the bar, OK? So to, we got those other statutes we talked about. We don't need to do that. Um, very free, so if you're disabled, you're otherwise qualified, we now have to give you reasonable accommodations. There's very, very few circumstances where we can deny that, okay? Fundamental change in the program or activities, that's not going to be something you're deciding. It's got to be an unreasonable cost to the institution. We got a 
billion dollars in the budget of the university so that isn't going to fly and it's not it's an, it it costs you money or or it costs you time it doesn't matter that it costs you time we have a duty to do it and, and we have a testing center on campus where you can send the students with disability services um, can take their test there to get the time and a half if that doesn't work because all the slots are filled it is your responsibility. It is not ODS's responsibility. I can't emphasize that enough. It is you are the teacher. It is your job to make sure the accommodation is provided. We have an office who can help you do it, but the, the responsibility didn't transfer to them. It is your responsibility. All right, some tips to avoid legal exposure. I'm gonna fly through them, but if, if, if I give a lot more detail on page 46 and a handout. Um, really just taking you through these tips so that don't, don't worry that I'm flying because you've got it all in writing. Um, so you don't get to decide if there's an accommodation uh, or a qualifying disability. You just comply with the um, notice that is brought to you. Um, those are the first two. Don't discuss it in front of others. You want to avoid that lawsuit. Don't ask the student how it happened. You don't get to know what the disability is. Um, do discuss with the student how you're going to make this work, okay? So if it's time and a half, where's that going to happen? Is it going to be in the testing center? Is it going to be in your office? How's that going to work? And make sure you have that dialogue. And it is your, the law requires that dialogue, okay? So you're the adult in charge. You're going to have to lead that process. Do include a statement on your syllabus about registering with ODS if that's already pre-populated in the online syllabus. Don't ignore the recommended uh, accommodations because you personally disagree with them you have an appeal process if you feel really strongly about this but while that appeal process is going on you have to provide the accommodation you will expose yourself to civil liability right here this is a very important it's a lot a very important statute that gives a plaintiff a lot of um, monetary damages and you do not want to be wrong on this one um, so please do what, what we're saying, and if you refuse to do it, then we're not gonna be able to defend you. Call ODS if you disagree, and um, do provide that accommodation while any appeal is pending. Um, learn that students can schedule their test online through this clockwork test scheduling, and there's a little video online that tells you how to do that, so go look at those websites. Don't ask a student who brings a dog into class if they have a notice from the Office of Disability Services. There's this quirky little rule in Department of Justice and the regulations that say if you need a service animal, you don't have to go register with the Disability Services. There are two questions and only only two that you can ask a student who brings a dog to class. Is the dog required because of a disability? What work or task is the dog trained to perform? That's it. Nothing else. They don't need a notice. Don't ask. Don't, it doesn't make maybe logical sense because all the other disabilities get registered. Just, just trust me. These are the regs. Don't ask anything but those two questions. All the time when you've got questions about these issues, you're going to call the Office of Disability Services. As far as note takers, that's going to be a common accommodation. We have a process now online to ensure the confidentiality of those notes. Um, you're going to um, not identify the student in the class, but you're going to ask for volunteers in your class who would be a note taker. You're not going to identify that student. You're going to create a folder in the box account for each course that a student needs an accommodation. You're going to send a link to the note taker so they can upload their notes and you're going to separately send a link to the student so they can access the notes and the the uh, note taker who does this will receive a hundred dollar stipend on their action card so if you're having trouble recruiting a note taker because you need one in your class please contact ODS and ask them for other tips but again it's not ODS's job it's your job to get that done um, and work to make sure that your websites YouTube videos, et cetera, are captioned and accessible. Um, we have a whole office on campus now, our technology accessibility support office that can help you with that. So those are some of the things that you can do. Um, here's a slide that gives you a lot of contact information, our Office of Disability Services, the Emerging Technology and Accessibility for captioning, and then each college has a Section 504 ADA liaison. Um, if there's a complaint that's um, because we haven't done this right, that's going to be directed to Dr. Gwen Hood, who's our UA ADA 504 coordinator. If you're an employee and you need an accommodation, 
I told you earlier we have a one-stop shop. You can go to this website. You're going to go basically to the same person in HR who's going to handle a pregnant employee, a religious observant, or um, uh, dis student in excuse me, employee with a disability, it's Mar Emily Marbot, but you're going to contact the HR Service Center and fill out the paperwork and, and you'll be on your way to um, having some dialogue to determine that. All right, we're going to fly through. How are we doing? Okay. Good. Okay. All right. FERPA. We're going to take questions at the end, by the way. Um, FERPA is Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. That is the law that regulates the privacy of your student records. And the fact that you're actually a GTA is actually a protected status. We can't go tell the world unless you give us consent about that. Um, reasons I want you to know it was one, is one, the faculty handbook says, and it applies to faculty and staff, um, and it says that you have to know this policy and you have to observe appropriate precautions when handling student information. So it's our own internal policy, plus it's the law, and we want to avoid an investigation by the Department of Education Office of Chief Privacy Office. That's the group, I call them the, the FERPA police in Washington. They're the ones that can come down and investigate us. That's who a student would file a complaint with. Um, the good news is, is they can't sue under this statute. They might sue for a tort claim, a breach of privacy claim, um, but they can't sue in, in federal court and get attorney's fees, so that's a, a positive thing. But the worst thing possible is that the Department of Education could fine us and could also take away our federal financial assistance, meaning all of us on loans would not go, be able to go to school. And, and I also want you to know these rules so that you'll feel comfortable sharing information when you can so that we can avoid situations you're going to hear um, the Virginia Tech situations, the, the active shooter, somebody's in your class who's acting really strange and declining, and you'll get experts uh, talking to you all day today about that. I want you to understand FERPA so you know when you can tell us about that. And I'm going to tell you, in those circumstances, you can share it with anybody on this campus who has a need to know. Okay, so let's go through some of the, the rules on that. There is some other UA training available. The registrar has put um, some incredible uh, information online. One of the pieces of information is on uh, page 58 of your notebook. It's the quick guide for faculty. I went ahead and printed it. It's online, but it's a great resource for you. They have a FERPA fact sheet that has some hints and says, don't use your student ID name and uh, name to post grades. Leave graded test for students to sort through. We just had that happen by a faculty member. Leave a box out with all the graded. Y'all come get it. And so another student who wasn't happy about the grade stole the box and, and decided to build their case based on the other people's grading to show, see how, and so don't do that. I, I couldn't believe that happened um, as much as we train on this. Um, people's grades are private information. Um, don't circulate electronically or in print a class list with the student name and CWID. That's because that CWID can be used in conjunction with their um, other information to actually order pizzas from Domino's Pizzas. And we've actually had to expel some students who stole um, because some teacher passed around, put your name in CWID. Another clever student picked up the CWIDs and had a grand Domino's pizza bill, um, and he's no longer here. <laughs> um, let's see, you want to include, um, you don't want to provide anyone with list of students enrolled in your classes. Why? Because who's in your class is private information. Um, you don't want to provide anyone with student schedules. If you're an advisor and you're able to print off their schedule, that's private information, unless one of these exceptions that I'm going to talk about. Um, if somebody asks you to write a letter of reference and they give you a resume, you're not going into the records at all to write a reference, so you're good. But if you have to go into the record, your record book, to figure out, okay, I got 300 students, what about this one, and they want me to write a reference, you're now in FERPA world, okay? So now you're going to need their consent to write that reference if you're going to rely on any record. Um, all right, so basically under FERPA, there's three primary rights. You have a right to review your own education record. You have the right to seek to amend your education record. And you have the right to limit your disclosure of your education records to third parties. 
Um, and there's a lot of legitimate exceptions to this disclosure rule in the regulations, and it's also in our policy. If you really can't sleep at night and you want to get online and read it, it's all there. But it's very boring. Um, we're going to cover five of them, okay, the five that I think are the most important for you. Before we get into what those exceptions are, you first have to understand what does FERPA protect. FERPA protects records, okay? files, documents, other materials that might be in a database, it might be an email, the grades, whatever, that contain information directly related to a student and is maintained by the University of Alabama, okay? Now, there's some things called sole possession records. They might be your own personal note taking, your own grid sheet when you're teaching, and you're not planning, you don't have to turn it into your department chair, your boss, it's for you. That's called a sole possession record, and that's not a FERPA covered record so that a student who has a right to inspect doesn't get to come and inspect your own private little cheat sheets and stuff like that, okay? So there's one exception about that. Also, oral conversations personal observations are not FERPA records, okay? If you see a student doing something, it's not a record, you saw it. If a student tells you something, they told it to you, it's not a record. If you'll remember that one main thing right there, that FERPA is not like HIPAA going to the doctor or coming to, to me as an attorney in an attorney-client relationship, our conversations when we're in that kind of relationship are privileged. Nobody gets to know them. Same thing when you go to your physician. Nobody gets to know those conversations. That's not true with FERPA. FERPA is only records. So get that in your brain and that'll help you work through some of the, oh, can I tell the parent about this? If it wasn't in a record, you can tell them everything. If you, if you have a small class and Susie hadn't been in class all week and parents calling you, you can tell them Susie hadn't been in class all week because you didn't have to go look at a record to determine that, okay? So that if you can get that in your brain, it'll really help uh, work through some of the things with parents. I will, caution about emails. You may have a difficult email, a difficult student and you are sharing it with your friend, which you really shouldn't be doing, but it's another GTA and you're seeking advice on how to handle it. And you, you know, you wish, it's one of those emails you wish you hadn't written. Um, it was brutally honest. Um, realize that that record, that is a record, is a document, it's an email that has a student's name and it's maintained by the university on our servers. That is a FERPA record. So if a student asked to see their record, they could see that email. The point here is be cautious about what you write in your emails. If you don't have to email and you can just talk about it, I would, uh, that would be the safer thing to do. Um, don't retain emails that you don't need to keep. Get out your frustration, you got it out, delete it, okay? Sometimes I email myself to get it all out and then I just delete it. It makes me feel better and it might make you feel better. Um, so you're gonna have to keep an email as confidential and secure as you do their grades, okay? Because it's a FERPA record. Um, beware too of student phishing scams, okay? So, and this is more to help you with security. Beware of those emails coming to you that you don't know what they are. Pay attention to what OIT sends you on this. If you click on something that you shouldn't have clicked on and we get some ransomware and it encrypts all our um, shared drives, everything you've got access to, it's a really big messy thing. So just be careful about that. It's not really fair, but I just threw it in there to, to get a little training on that. All right, so what, when can I disclose information? What are those five exceptions I want you to know today? Anytime a student gives you written consent. The consent's got to identify the records to be released and to whom the purpose for the disclosure, a student's signature, and a date. That's it, it's very simple. If, you, if you're in the medical field and you know about HIPAA, there's like 16 different things that have to be on that form, not true. This is very, not true with FERPA. It's very easy for a student to give consent. Um, the registrar's office tracks the consent to parents um, or guardian, and let me tell you on page 51 of your handbook, um, handbook I had the registrar's office prepare a one sheet on if you had to go into Banner and go look for that record, where would it be? I'm not smart enough to know all that. I just, it's there as a resource, okay? So um, what you wanna do is if you're talking with um, a parent, you're going to want to um, 
Well, we'll get to that in a minute. I just realized I had some slides. Uh, but basically, you're going to want to teach the parent how to teach the student to give consent to the parent and, and it be tracked in our banner system. Another, so get consent, that's always safe. Two is directory information. And directory information is anything on this slide. Okay, good. Anything on this slide is directory information and we can give it to the Tuscaloosa News, we can give it to CNN, we can give it to anybody, unless the student has put a hold on their records. Okay, and this applies to you and your student status too, okay? Um, we may, you know, less than 0.05%, I'd say, put a hold on their records. They might be in some witness protection or their parents are in a nasty divorce and one parent, you know, they don't want somebody to, to even know where they are. It could be a um, protection from abuse kind of situation. It's very rare, but Banner tracks whether or not someone has put a hold. So if there's a hold and we released even this kind of non-threatening information, we would be in violation of FERPA. So you got to check with Banner, but it's not harmful if we can, if we release the names. So you could release somebody's name, but you just can't say they're my student because if you see on there, the class they're taking is not directory information, okay? So name, address, email address, just things that aren't harmful if they were released. A third exception, which is gonna be the one that probably got Virginia Tech in trouble because they didn't realize they could share. If there's another employee on this campus who has a legitimate need to know, if I'm the lawyer and I call you and say we're dealing with a matter and I need to see the records, and I've done this before and the GTA very had been to the training and actually said, well, let me check with my supervisor and did not just respond to me. And I thought that was an absolute, I thought, yay, points. You, you shouldn't, if you're not comfortable, if you don't know who I am and I'm calling you for records, you better check it out with your supervisor. But we can have access to your records if we have a legitimate business need to know. I had two children who went through this grand university and I would have been in violation of FERPA if I had called the graduate school and said, would you tell me how my kid's doing in grad school right now or whatever. I, you can't use it for things that are personal. It's only do you have a legitimate business need to know. So you're going to get academic advisors asking you questions. The athletic department might be asking about a student athlete, athlete your department chair, your deans, our office, internal audit. Um, the provost, etc. We all have the right to know. You're going to hear from um, some just UAPD from um, our threat assessment team, um, Charlie Dorsey, that those people are going to get to know. Why? Because they have legitimate need to know. The fourth one is the big one with parents. Um, that's, that's what I meant when I said change, turn to page 51 to see when, when a parent has um, um, how a parent can help their student give consent through Banner. But I want you to know this, when, and this is hard for our parents, when they're in K through 12, the right to inspect records and all the FERPA rights belong to the parent. Once they come to the University of Alabama, all those rights transfer to the student. So parents have no rights but nobody for, somebody forgot to tell them that. <laughs> and we're the messenger, and that's not a happy message for a parent. Um, that's, that's what I meant when I said change, turn to page 51 to see when, when a parent has, um, and this is hard for our parents. When they're in K through 12, the right to inspect records and all the FERPA rights belong to the parent. Once they come to the University of Alabama, all those rights transfer to the student. So parents have no rights, but nobody for, somebody forgot to tell them that. <laughs> and we're the messenger, and that's, that's, that's what I meant when I said change. Turn to page 51 to see when, when a parent has, um, and this is hard for our parents. When they're in K through 12, the right to inspect records and all the FERPA rights belong to the parent. Once they come to the University of Alabama, all those rights transfer to the student. So parents have no rights, but nobody for, somebody forgot to tell them that. <laughs> and we're the messenger, and that's.